Thank you very much, Randy and Murrow, President Murrow. Thank you for being here. I know you've got a busy night, and we appreciate you taking your time. And my good friend Hank Huckabee, great to see you and all the dignitaries here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. As president of Georgia Tech, I came to this campus quite a few times, and it always impressed me with its beauty and the dignity of the campus itself. And coming back tonight, you get to see the growth and the vitality of this campus. So it's wonderful to be back here at West Georgia. Now, it's uh, good that you got your football game tonight because I guess the Panthers are playing the Wolves, and those are both endangered species. <laughs> and the Smithsonian's Zoo works a lot on endangered species. <laughs> So you're doing your part to let people know how valuable those animals are. <laughs> let me thank Randy especially for inviting me here and for hosting this for the Academy and particularly for the commission that I was so fortunate to work on. The heart of the matter, the humanities and social sciences for a vibrant, competitive, and secure nation. The report was really a result of a two-year study uh, by the commission and there were many, many members who were um, university presidents, there were corporate leaders there, government leaders, and, and so forth. It was co-chaired by Dick Broadhead, who's president of Duke University, and John Rowe, former CEO of Exelon Corporation. The study, interestingly enough, was an outgrowth of a request from Congress, believe it or not. They actually can do things that are bipartisan. And uh, they actually re requested this study uh, and have taken great interest in it. And I think it's really fortuitous that we're able to come here in concert uh, with your prestigious annual interdisciplinary conference on the humanities that you've operated for 28 years. And so give a big hand to you guys. For <laughs> and I noted in some of your news clips that John Furling, who, who was here for many years as a faculty member in history, was just given a 2013 Governor's Award for Arts and Humanities. So congratulations to, to John. So what was the commission all about? It really was to explore the state of humanities in our nation. And uh, all of us here, I suspect, appreciate that humanities are important. We know, for example, they're essential to our democracy, our global competitiveness, and individually to a full and meaningful life. But there are indicators that suggest the public understanding of the role of humanities in and in our lives is on the decline. This is reflected in, in reduced support for our humanities-based institutions, a development which threatens our future. Funding for the National Endowment of the Humanities is down about 20% between 2010 and 2013. And right here in Georgia, uh, since 2008, funding for your Humanities Council has gone from $250,000 to 50, to 50. And that hasn't helped Georgia balance its budget one bit, but it's taken a lot away from the people of Georgia. So I'm thankful to be here tonight because this is an important time for us to talk about this. And you may know also, if you read the New York Times this morning, a decline of students enrolling in humanities courses, which means ultimately loss of faculty position and loss of opportunity for young faculty. I mean, it's, it's a feeding uh, type of system. So it's important for us to have this dialogue. And I'm honored to be one of the participants in the discussion that will take place later with my colleagues, Rosanna Warren, Esther McIntosh, and Bob Schaefer. That's important. Then I want to recognize again the Georgia Humanities Council. Jamil Zadadin, did I say that right? Close. Close, close. <laughs> uh, and the council are great partners with the Smithsonian. It's great that West Georgia is participating as well, giving people, especially in rural areas, access to programs they would not have otherwise. I appreciate that because I grew up in the tiny town of Douglas, Georgia, in South Georgia, in Coffee <laughs> County. And these opportunities mean so much to these small communities. Our Smithsonian Traveling Exhibition Service serves this role not only here in Georgia, but also nationally, reaching nearly 5 million Americans around the country. The Georgia Humanities Council is one of our longest and deepest partnerships, working with programs like the Museum on Main Street, Jamil helped us design, uh, and most recently, as you just heard, New Harmonies, celebrating American roots music. Let's talk a little bit about humanities then writ large. The word humanities has Latin roots, which mean to be human. On the National Mall, in the Smithsonian's Nat Nat National Museum of Natural History, one of our new exhibitions is the Hall of Human Origins. It follows the arc of human history, beginning six million years ago, when humans began to develop. It's based on a compilation of the findings in the last 200 years of archaeology and paleontology. The principal question, you go to their website, the principal question it asks is, what does it mean to be a human? There have been many species of humans, as you all know. They're all extinct, but one, 
Homo sapiens, we're the last. We are a very recent phenomenon, having been around only 200,000 years or so, probably figured it more like 100,000, which is just a blink in the eye of, history, of the history of the world. I'm a geology uh, uh, minor, and you know how uh, long time can be in geologic time. Well, the steps involved in becoming human, you can see that if you track through the exhibition, it's fabulous, revolve around evolutionary and technological developments, like fire, most of which were related to developing better survival skills. However, when the Homo sapiens species arrived, they were already starting to use color. We know that now, Smithsonian's work has identified that to decorate themselves and to actually go through a funeral ceremony. And around 40,000 years ago, although some may push that back a little bit, in Europe and elsewhere, Homo sapiens began to make drawings and three-dimensional sketches. Now there's a debate about when humans arrived into this Western Hemisphere, but some experts and several scholars at the Smithsonian are among those believe that evidence supports that humans migrated from Europe to the Atlantic coast, not just across the land bridge, 20,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago. At one of these locations recently, they discovered a mammoth tusk, and on this mammoth tusk was a work of art, a work of art. And so when humans came to this hemisphere, they brought with them art. So clearly one element of what it means to be a human is art, both the innate desire to make it and the inherent pleasure of looking at it. This is as true today as it was 20,000 or 40,000 years ago. Art and humanities inform and enrich our lives. Now the commission report, the heart of the matter, advances also three societal reasons for a greater appreciation of the humanities. Educate, educate Americans in the knowledge, skills, and understanding they will need to thrive in a 21st century democracy. Foster a society that is innovative, competitive, and strong. Equip the nation for leadership in an interconnected world, those three. Now I relate to these from my background in training in engineering. Not everybody would see this connection, but it was always obvious to me that to live a full life, I had to understand art, history, and culture, and it was critical to me. When I was interviewing to be president of Georgia Tech, I told a search committee that if Georgia Tech wanted to be a great university, it would have to embrace a larger role for the humanities. And that engineering and business and architecture graduates of the future would have to compete in a global economy where there would be twice as many very bright Chinese engineers, all of whom spoke English. Not to take anything away from them, but it's a competitive edge that China has. The edge we could provide was in graduating young men and women who used both sides of their brains and were able to understand the cultures of other countries and move with ease across societal boundaries. To me, this meant increasing the students' exposure to humanities during their college experience. Now, after I arrived at Georgia Tech, I began to review information about the students coming there from uh, longitudinal surveys that had been done a long time. One of the things that struck my eye was over 60% of the students said they played musical instruments in high school. And I realized when they got to Georgia Tech, there was no place for them to play musical instruments. So one of the first things we did was to offer our students many more opportunities to participate in musical performances. What was peculiar about what happened was we couldn't keep up with the demand. It was there, we just didn't know it. We then added many options for study abroad and found out again, it was hard to keep up with the demand. And a side product was the number of students taking languages quintupled. We didn't require it, it just happened. And in the course of our first capital campaign, Rosanna, we funded two, donors funded two endowed chairs in poetry. Poetry courses were added along with poetry reading. Some of you have been there, I understand. And again, students responded by signing up in large numbers. Our students obviously welcomed exposure to the humanities. And while this was a good thing in itself, it did not take long to manifest itself in other ways. Our graduation rate went up 15% in about six years. And when we did our alumni surveys, when we had enough time for them to get out of the workforce, we heard back that humanities education that I had at Georgia Tech gave me an advantage to compete in the workforce, particularly as they work in a global environment. So the bottom line is it worked for our students, and more importantly, it's working for our nation because we're graduating more of these bright people, and they've been educated more completely than they were before. 
So let me add now one last important point regarding what the report calls our 21st century democracy. Our present democracy, of course, has its roots in the thoughts of our founders who understood the need for a well-rounded education for all citizens if this new form of government was to survive. Remember in those days there were very few schools and universities. Most of the universities were religious based. Thomas Jefferson wrote, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. And James Madison wrote, what spectacle can be more edifying as more or more seasonable than that of liberty and learning, each leaning on each other for their mutual and surest support? So from the beginning, the founding fathers knew you needed a well-rounded education for our citizens. Now at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American History in Flag Hall, right in front of the home for the great Star Spangled Banner, the flag that we celebrate for our, uh, saving us in 1812, we hold citizen naturalization ceremonies, and I go to as many as I can. Last year, I participated in one such ceremony with former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, who herself is a naturalized citizen, remarkable person. At the ceremony, 12 people from 12 different countries took the oath of citizenship, and among them was U.S. Marine Corps Sergeant Christian Lujan, born in Mexico. Sergeant Lujan stood out in his crisp Marine uniform and I later learned in talking to him that in the course of his military service, he had already fulfilled tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. You have to think about that. Here's a man who volunteered for our military, risked his life for us, who wasn't a citizen of our country. So I asked him, what was this all about? And he said joining the Marines was his way of qualifying to be an American. When I asked him what becoming an American US citizen meant to him, he said, I will have a say a voice that will be heard, the right to vote, and make a decision that will count towards the future and my family. Would that every citizen who was born in this country knew that. Now, the American History Museum has a new website, Preparing for the Oath. This website was designed in cooperation with the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services to allow aspiring citizens to prep for the civics and history portion of the citizenship test. They use quizzes, videos, and activities, and often show them artifacts from the Smithsonian's collections, such as Thomas Jefferson's own writing desk, which he designed and wrote the Declaration of Independence on, and lesser ones like the census posters from 1930s and 1940s. I would suggest that it would be edifying, because I've taken this test, if every citizen of this country had to periodically pass a citizenship test, <laughs> just like we have to do to keep our driver's license. I think we can all agree that being a good citizen is just as important as being a good driver. Of course, my guess is in a country where only 18% of the high school students can pass a standardized history test, the numbers passing the citizenship test will be a lot less than numbers passing the driver's test. But rather than viewing this too negatively, I believe that the humanities taught in a way that encourages critical thinking and with creative approaches can not only be fruitful, but also fun. I believe the experience we had at Georgia Tech with our students shows just that. And at the Smithsonian, we are encouraged that our visitorship overall has risen by five million people in the last five years. We're up from about 20, about 31 million this year. So about from 26 million to 21. And we've increased the visitorship to our website by 60 million in the last two years. People want what the Smithsonian has. This is really good news. People in growing numbers are coming to the Smithsonian to learn from our art, history, culture, and, and culture museums, as well as our science museum. I believe that after years of being dosed by unsubstantiated information and 24-hour news cycles, there is a hunger out there for the authentic and knowledge that helps you understand your country and your world. And we need to take advantage of that moment. As John Lithgow said, who's one of the members of the commission, and I can't say it as well as he said it, but I'll try, in a speech called Joy in a Fretful World. Democracy can only function with an educated citizenry grounded in the humanities. A lot of exclamation points. The humanities create a habit of learning that lasts a lifetime, exclamation point. There are sources of self-knowledge, exclamation point. 
Life without them is drab and joyless. Two exclamation points. <laughs> joy, that's the word, joy, exclamation point. The arts and humanities instill joy, exclamation point. John was a really fabulous member of this commission, as, as uh, was George Lucas. Uh, they came to every meeting and they were terrific. So that, my friends, I think is the heart of the matter. This is what we must do if the role of humanities is to be restored to its rightful place in our country. So thank you for taking time to be with me tonight and go forth and do good work for the humanities. Thank you.